Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today's message is the predictable path of life change, and it's found in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. To fill in the blanks and follow along with the life notes, you can download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here's Pastor Peter Bunnell. It's great to be with you all today. I'm Pastor Pete. If you don't know me yet, I'm one of the pastors here. I am in charge of the life groups and ministries like that, and I am glad to be with you all as we continue our series in the book of Galatians called Fruitful Living. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and open to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verse 11 through 24. If you happen to be in the room using one of the Bibles that are in the seats under you, that's page 11. 1154. And of course, as always, if you need a Bible at home, we would love for you to take that Bible home and read it because we know it will change your life. And for those of you that are online, we have that same offer for you. If you need a Bible, message the host and we will get one out to you because we truly believe that um, lives are changed as we read the Bible, because there in the Bible is where we meet Jesus. And Calvary is all about leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So we want you to have God's word and we want you to read God's word. And so uh, speaking of life change, which we're hoping that Bible will produce in your life as you get to know Jesus better, uh, that is today's topic. We're talking about the predictable path of life change. So when I was a young teenager, I was kind of known for my anger. I would go into my bedroom, and if I had something special and I was angry, I would break it. If I had a trophy that I had won, I would do my best to bend that plastic gold um, until that leg would break off or something like that. Uh, Thankfully, today... I'm known not really for flying off the handle or having a bad temper, but being a little bit more calm, um, which I'm glad that God has done that in my life. Would be sad if I was still the same person I was in junior high, right? Uh, In the year 2000, I told my soon-to-be wife that we would never go on the mission field. But by 2005, I was packing up my wife and my 13-month-old son to move to one of the most remote mission fields in the world because God had changed my heart and changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, In 2017, as I was preparing to preach um, a sermon in uh, Iowa at the church where I was serving, I experienced my first panic attack, um, all in the preparation for preaching. And today I'm able to be up here in front of you with relatively low anxiety, (laughs) rightly thinking about what God is doing what it means for me to be up here preaching. And um, today you even get to experience a little bit of extra life change because I don't have my comfort blanket of that podium in front of me and I don't have a nice thick notebook of notes in front of me. So we're trying something a little bit new and if this aspect of life change bombs, you can come back tomorrow and I'll have the podium and the notebook with me. So in all of those scenarios, what is happening? God is moving, God is working, and helping us to become something different because of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is working. And today, when we come to Galatians chapter one, we are being introduced to Paul's story of life change. He's gonna tell us what happened in his life. So let's take a look, Galatians one, verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age, So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, 
nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brothers. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. So in a couple of paragraphs, we have Paul laying out his life change. If you want to read about it more in detail, jot down Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. You can go and read that this week, and you can hear in detail what Jesus did in Paul's life. Paul is bringing it up here because he wants you, he wants his readers, which today it's us, he wants you to understand that the gospel that he's presenting, he got directly from Jesus. This is not a gospel that he made up. This is not a gospel he got from somebody else. This is a gospel he got from Jesus. And when he got that gospel, he went from being a persecutor to being a preacher. So Paul, originally named Saul, was committed to destroying the church, destroying people who were believing in Jesus. He was there and approved of the murder of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Then he was emboldened by that, and he started going around arresting Christians, putting them in jail, intimidating them. But on the way to Damascus, when he was going to persecute the church there, Jesus appeared to him. He interrupted Paul's life, blinded Paul, and told Paul to go into town and wait because someone would come and explain to him and heal him. So Paul received the instruction from a man named Ananias. He was healed, scales fell from his eyes, and then he was baptized. Just like the family was baptized, Paul was baptized by a man named Ananias because he had received the gospel. And this change was something that God did. And there's this predictable path of life change that God works in our lives, and we see it here in Paul's life. The first step in that path is surrendering to the gospel. We must surrender to the gospel. Last week, Pastor Robert walked us through that gospel, but I'm gonna just explain it really quick again. We are all sinners, and because we're sinners, we are destined to death and we are destined to hell. But because God loved us, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. After living a perfect life, Christ died for us. And when he died, he took our sin upon him. But three days later, he rose again to show that he could give us new life. So that's the gospel in a nutshell. And we, we, when we surrender to it, we're saying, okay, I'm trusting Jesus. I've got nothing else. I can't keep going in this direct trajectory, my own trajectory, because the end is death, the end is hell. So I turn from that. I repent from that, and I trust in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Paul did this. You see it in the text here. It's kind of hidden in some of the words, but in verse 13, it says he confesses who he was. I was violently persecuting the church of God. That's verse 13. That's who I was. That was my trajectory. That was my sin. But then in verse 15, you hear the trust. You hear that he's believing in God because God called him to his grace. So grace, this free gift of new life through Jesus Christ. God gave that to Paul. Paul accepted it. He believed in Jesus Christ. And so this is the first step for anybody who's going to have life change. They have to surrender to the gospel. They have to repent and trust in Jesus. But then do you know what? We just keep on living that out. That's what the Christian life is supposed to be. In Romans chapter 13, verse 14, Paul writes to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Put on Jesus and 
make no provision. Take off the provisions for the, f- the, for the flesh. This is called putting off and putting on. This is one of the keys to living the Christian life and experiencing life change. We all get the idea of putting off and putting on. Yesterday, it got a little bit hot in Lake Havasu, and it was the reminder that in a few weeks, we're going to be triple digits, right? <laughs> and, and the sweatshirts and the coats are going to get put in the back of the closet, put in a drawer. We're not going to need those for a while. But I can guarantee you something. Inevitably, one of my children is going to hold on to her coat. And it'll be July, and she's going to put that coat on because she loves that coat. Even though it's 120, she will be putting on that coat and wearing it because she loves that old clothing so much. So when, when we're talking about our life in Christ, we kind of do that same thing. We hold on to those old comfortable clothing that's part of our old life and we fail to take it off and put on Christ. In Colossians 3, it's another great passage where Paul walks through what it means to put off and put on. In chapter, in in Colossians 3, 5, Paul says that we have to put off malice, anger, greed, idolatry, sexual immorality. He says to put those things off. And then in verse 12, he says to put on compassion, love, kindness, gentleness. He says to put on speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He's painting this picture that we have to put off the old life, that's repentance, and we have to put on the new life, trusting God, and that what he's going to do is better than those old clothes. So if you're here today and you're thinking, yeah, life change would be nice. I would really like, or it'd probably be good for me to stop yelling at my kids. You know, you're not gonna be able to do that by simply putting on silence. You can't just say, okay, I'm gonna put off yelling, I'm gonna put on silence. You can't do that. You have to put on something better. You have to put on encouraging words. You have to put on instruction in the Lord. And when you do that, then you will experience life change. If you're here and you're thinking about the fact that you're involved in a relationship where there's sexual immorality, you're not gonna be able to just be like, okay, well, we're just gonna stop having sex. That's not gonna happen. You're gonna have to put off the sexual immorality and you're gonna have to put on righteous living, like not living in the same house with someone you're not married to. You're gonna have to put on righteous activity that brings you out into the light so that you're interacting with other people instead of hiding in the dark. That's what life change looks like. Or maybe if you are thinking, you know, we keep talking about reading the Bible, but I really don't do that. I don't like reading the Bible, it's hard to do. If you wanna start reading the Bible, you're probably gonna have to put off staying up late binge watching Netflix. And you're going to have to put on an alarm and then start reading the Bible. See, life change is about some of those hard choices. Putting off the old life, putting on the new life, repenting of our sin and trusting in Jesus that he has something better for us. So that's the first step in this predictable path of life change. If you want to have life change, take that first step. The second step is to allow time. We must allow time for change to take place. Did you catch the time frame as Paul was describing his life? It says here that he was saved, but he didn't go to Jerusalem. So he didn't go and present himself to all the church leaders after he was saved. It says that he went to Arabia and then he returned to Damascus. And then after three years, Three years, he went to see the other apostles. And then he only spent 15 days with them. This was not a big deal. It was two weeks, talking with Peter and James. That's it. Then, after that, it says that he went to Cilicia and to Syria. Do you want to know the time frame here based on the Bible timeline? This is 14 years. This is 14 years before the Apostle Paul is recognized as an apostle. This is 14 years before his ministry is recognized. It took time. 
He did not go from being a persecutor to being a preacher in one day. He didn't do it in a week. He didn't do it in a month. Over a decade of time went by before he was recognized for his life change. It's the same way for us today. Now, you hear a few of those stories where you hear about that instant life change. You know, like you come to Christ and then all of a sudden you no longer desire to drink or you no longer desire drugs or just your life just radically changed instantaneously. But do you know what? It takes time to prove that. It's proven over time. Paul's life change was pretty instantaneous. It wasn't like he was like, whoops, I accidentally killed another Christian today. No, I mean, he stopped killing Christians. He stopped arresting Christians. But it took a track record. It took time. It took years of proving that life change. Some of our life change looks a little bit more like a battle, like a struggle, like where we're starting over more times than we ever want to admit because the sin that we're used to just keeps dragging us down, getting a hold of us, and we keep falling into it. It's a longer process, but during that long process of time, God is working out some things in our life, and he's going to complete that life change. I liken this to birthday candles, okay? Birthday candles. Got your cake, comes, everyone sings to you, you blow them out, and they're gone. They're dead. That's like that instant life change, right? You just blow them out, smoke, done, they're not coming back to fire. But then you have those trick candles. How many of you have had trick candles on a cake, right? When I was a kid, I was like, mom, come on, give me trick candles. Okay, so, so you get the trick candles, you blow them out, and you think, okay, it's, they're dead. But then they spark back up. They light up again. And you're like, okay. So then you're like, blow harder. They light up again. And, and that cycle can continue and can continue This is that battle kind of life change. It's like that temptation, that failure, it just keeps coming back. And then you say, okay, somebody get me a cup of water. And then you take the candle and you dip it in the water. And then that candle is dead. Life change takes time, but also life change needs to involve other people. And that's the third step. Life change needs to involve other people. Just like that candle, trick candle needs the help. You need somebody to go get that glass of water for you. You need to involve other people in your process of life change. Paul did it. He doesn't mention everyone who was involved, but he does mention that uh, he was with Peter, that's Cephas, and James. Um, Ananias, I mentioned him already. Ananias was the man that came and prayed for Paul. Then the church in Damascus welcomed Paul in, even though he had actually come there to persecute them. They welcomed him in. They were a part of his life. You've got some of the apostles. But then another man that was really instrumental in Paul's life was Barnabas. Barnabas is the encourager who said, hey, Paul, I want you to serve with me. And he brought Paul along to Syria and to Cilicia, to Antioch. And that's where Paul cut his teeth on Christian ministry. And the elders in Antioch are the ones who prayed and sent Barnabas and Paul off to do missions work. These are the people that were all a part of that life change that Paul needed to experience. Now, I hope that this encourages you today because I know there's people in this room that have a vision for ministry They have a vision for leadership. They have a vision for what they could do for God or in the church or in some type of ministry. And it feels like it's taking too much time. You're kind of tired of waiting. But here's the thing. It can take time. This is God's timetable. It took Paul 14 years. Time and people pouring into him, praying with him, serving with him. Others of you are thinking, I'm not thinking about ministry. I'm just thinking about this battle with sin that I'm totally engulfed in. I can't even imagine being done with it. The pornography, the anger, the critical spirit, the sexual immorality, the homosexuality, the greed, the lying, the pride, the self-righteousness, Those things are just like inundating your life and you're like, I just need that to change. 
That's what needs to change. Listen, you name it, in a crowd this size, everyone is gonna have something that they resonate with. They're gonna resonate with those sins and those struggles. And we are not supposed to walk this Christian life alone. Christian life is not about being a lone wolf. We have got to be involved with other people. In, um, Paul wrote about this in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. He says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. That's what we're supposed to be doing with one another, encouraging each other and building each other up. In James 5, 16, James writes to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you can be healed. So when somebody comes to you and says, hey, here's the burden I'm carrying. Here's the thing I'm struggling with. All you got to do is encourage them, build them up. Don't like gasp, like, oh my gosh, that sin? No, because everyone, I mean, we get it, right? You just encourage them, you build them up, you pray for them, you listen to them. It's not rocket science. It's just being a brother or sister in Christ. So um, in, in uh, Hebrews 10, 24, the author there writes that we are to um, consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. When we get together, we're supposed to be thinking about how we can encourage each other to be better, to be more loving, to do more good deeds. This is what the Christian life is supposed to be like. So my question, is the weekend describing your Christian life? I mean, coming here for one hour on the weekend, is this your Christian life? If you're online, is tuning in for one hour is that your Christian life? If it is, is God happy with it? That's the big question. Is God happy with that? I think God wants you to get more involved. He wants people that are in your life that you're face to face with, not shoulder to shoulder with, but face to face with talking and living life together. So if you have a hurt that you're trying to get over, if you've had a habit you're trying to break, if you have a hang up that is dragging you down, let me encourage you to come back to this room on Monday night at 6.30 and join Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> what you will do is you will find a community of over 100 people that are all seeking life change. They're all seeking to get something different going on in their life. They're trying to get over those things. We have to take those steps and we need to pursue that type of life change. Maybe you're here and you're in a life group, but you're one of the typical statistics in, our, in a life group. Here's the sad news. It's like 50% attendance in a life group. Like many of our life group members only come 50% of the time. Okay, so what does that mean mathematically? Well, life groups only meet about 27 weeks out of the year. So about half of the year. And then if your typical life group member is skipping half of those, you're talking about 25% of the year, you're getting together with somebody in a life group and talking about life. That's just not enough. So if you're one of those, you know, hit and miss life group people, let me encourage you to show up to your life group and start talking about life. Start sharing what God is doing in your life. Now I know there's other people that are sitting here, Pete, I don't know what a life group is. Uh, I've never been in one, or I tried one, I didn't like it. Um, some people are saying, CR doesn't really sound like my jam. I don't really know if I really wanna do this. Hey, guess what? Start your own life group this week. I'm giving you all freedom. Start your own life group, you can do it. You can do it. You get three to four of your friends, three to, or even if you don't have friends, three to four people. <laughs> three to four people that you kind of know that come to Calvary and say, hey, let's get together for coffee and talk about the sermon. The curriculum for your life group is inside your worship bulletin every single week. You do not have to have a special dispensation from the church or from me to start a life group. Just get together with your friends and talk about the sermon and pray together and talk about what life is happening around you. So once we involve these other people, the final thing is that we have to remember that ultimately God gets the glory. Ultimately, God gets the glory. Let me read again Galatians 23, 
and 24. The people in Judea, they only were hearing it said that he, Paul, who used to persecute us, is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. The end result of life change is that God receives glory. That's what happened here in the Bible. Paul didn't receive the glory. God received the glory. Do you guys ever get life change envy? You know, you hear about a life change and you're like, man, why doesn't God do something like that for me? You know, and so we, we take it and we make it about us instead of about God and what he did. Or how about um, getting involved in the people praise? We're like, wow, I can't believe that you did that. You're, you must really have a close relationship with God. And we praise the person because of the life change that they've seen. Sharing your story is not about getting glory. It's about giving glory to God. So are you holding back something and robbing God of the glory that he desires? Do you, do you love those trick candles? You just want them to spark up again because you like the excitement, you like the temptation? Do you love that old coat and it's July and you know you don't need it, but you're gonna put it on anyways and walk around in your old life? Are you so committed to being a lone wolf? Are you so committed to isolationism that you're willing to sacrifice the life change and the glory that God could get if you just open up and share what's going on with the people around you? These are all ways that we rob God of the glory and we don't experience the life change that he wants to provide us. So today, what is it that God wants to change in your life? Where is he leading you? How is your conscience stirred today? Are you here and you've never taken that first step of surrendering to the gospel? It's really simple. It's just confessing, hey, I'm a sinner and I know I need Jesus and believing in him right now. And if you do that today for the first time, come and tell someone on the prayer team, let them pray with you. Come and tell me out in the foyer or one of the other church leaders, we want to celebrate that with you. Is there a relationship that God is leading you to put off? You know there's this relationship that needs to change. Make that commitment to put that off this weekend and put on a new relationship with the right type of people? Is there a relationship you need to repair and your pride has kept you from asking for forgiveness and going to that person? Why not put off that pride this weekend and put on humility and go to that person and talk to them? Is it a secret addiction, a secret sin that you haven't told anyone? Why not make this the day that you do that and drag that sin into the light so that God can begin to change that in your life? If you start walking this predictable path of life change today, you will be different tomorrow. You will be different next week. You will be different next year but most importantly, you will be different for eternity. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the fact that you love us. We are thankful for the fact that you're willing to take people that are rebellious, people that are sinful, people that are um, obstinate, and you're willing to change our lives. You're willing to make us new because of Jesus because Jesus died on that cross for us, because Jesus paved a way for us to know you and to be more like you. Lord, we want to walk that path of life change. We want to be different. We don't wanna be the same people that we walked in this building as. We want to be better. We want to be more like you. And we want to be able to give you glory because of it. So we ask you to work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Saul experienced a profound encounter with Christ that changed his life and name. May we also embrace the transformative power of God's grace in our lives. Let us go forth boldly like Paul, proclaiming the gospel with conviction and relying on God's grace to guide us. If you'd like to learn more about Calvary, I invite you to visit our website, calvaryaz.com. There, you'll find information about upcoming events, you can follow us on our social media platforms, you can view and listen to past messages and give to support us financially. 
Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful week. Please come back and join us again next weekend. Bye-bye.